Babiš. Thank you. Um, thank you for the direction. Thank you for being uh, for inviting me here. Uh, it's good to be back in person. I've been at BobCon a few times and I've already enjoyed it. But I enjoyed it much more here than on, on this online thing, which was nice, but not as good as this thing. So this talk is about um, about Haskell. It's loud, is it? Um, it's about Haskell. And what is the maybe the most unique property of Haskell? Just shout it out. Laziness. Laziness. Correct. This is a talk about what? Purity. Purity. Both are very good. Yeah, laziness and purity will be a big theme of this talk. I'm going to talk about laziness. I'm going to show you a typical example of why laziness makes Haskell such a great programming language because you can write very elegantly, very high level, very concise code and solve problems that way, and it's really impressive. And we like to impress other non-Haskell users uh, with it. But then suddenly, maybe it doesn't actually quite work the way we hope it would. And I will try to make the point that maybe it should. And I will present an extension to Haskell, a, a library, so, um, so to say, that allows us to do even more lazy things. And we can see how it looks uh, from the user point of view. We can see a little bit in how we could implement that. And maybe at the end, we can discuss whether this is still pure to pick up that keyword. Um, so, often people say laziness is great because it means things are only evaluated when they're actually needed. And it's about saving, saving um, like computation. But I don't think that's the main purpose of laziness. Or at least it's not the only purpose of laziness. The other purpose of laziness is that it allows us to do not tying tricks. So who has heard about the expression tying the knot? Just to get a sense of the, of the crowd, that's good. I'll show what it means. It means defining something in terms of itself. This is the knot that we tie. And maybe one of the most famous examples for that is this definition of the Fibonacci numbers, which you've probably seen before. Uh, we say the list of Fibonacci numbers uh, starts with zero, and then one, and then we can complete the rest of the list by zipping the Fibonacci lists itself and, and uh, itself and shifted by one and continue that way to calculate the rest. So really we're defining Fibonacci numbers like the, the data structure in terms of itself. And that is something that you can't do in non-lazy languages. Because lazy, non-lazy means in order to do anything with this thing you have to fully know it. And then of course you you can't if you're referring to that. So this is maybe the essence of laziness. So let's walk through a little bit more, um, a slightly bigger example, maybe also a slightly more relevant example because production numbers you don't need that often. But you very often need to do graph traversals. Maybe you don't even see the graph immediately, but many problems that you're solving while programming are like, you have to do some reachability analysis or something. Like you have to walk through states, through nodes, through vertices, whatever. So let's look at a very small example here. We have a graph data structure. I'm choosing to represent graphs as a map from vertices identified by integers to the list of vertices that I chased. Um, and we want to calculate the reflexive transitive closure. And other terms, simpler terms, for each node in my graph, what, are, what is the set of all the other nodes that I can reach? So let's, let's do some light coding here. Uh, on the left, I have my editor, which will probably make the font a little bit larger. And on the right, there's a GHDI session that we can interact with it. I, I have a graph defined. It's a simple graph with three nodes, one, two, and three. And uh, one has an edge to three, two has an edge to one and three, and three has no edges. A very simple graph. So let's define this transitive closure thing. So, I'm going to use some helper um, definitions here. To be interested in a set of nodes for each node. So a data structure for that, let's call it reaches, could be a map that maps each uh, vertex of my graph to the set of vertices we can reach from there. I'm doing type-driven development, I'm writing down the types first, and then I'm thinking how to connect the things. Once I have that thing, I can calculate this graph easily by um, taking this reaches thing 
and then turning each of these sets to lists. So for some reason we want list on the other interface, but here we want. But um, well, for the reacher thing, we really don't care about how often I can reach an envelope. That's why I'm using sets. Okay, let's define this thing here. We have to do something with the graph G, and especially we have to do something with every node in the graph G. So let's maybe try to map some function over G. And actually we want to map with T. This means, uh, well, maybe it becomes clear when I start writing F. So this function F will get a vertex, and it will also get the successors of the vertex, the list of other nodes reachable in one step from me. And the goal is to do now for this function to define the set of vertices reachable from B. Now, certainly, V is reachable from B. This is the reflexive part of the reflexive transit loader. And then if you just think about like a, the, different, the, the specification of our problem, what we now want to do is, you know, well, we, we know that we can go in one step to all of the vertices in VS, and then if we knew for all of these what's reachable from them, we can just take the union of them. So that would look like this. We take the union of a bunch of sets, and which set, well, we take um, the successor, well, every successor of V, that's a, every prime in VS, and then we'll take whatever is reachable from here. And once I fix the typos, there's not, nothing read, read quickly anymore, so the program seems to be complete and, and happy, and that's it. That is a perfectly fine definition of the reflexive tension flow from reflexive of this thing. <laughs> and uh, you can run it, and it works. Um, wait, uh, probably have a typo? Yeah. Okay. Kind of spoiled the effect, but. Um, of course, I need to look at the things uh, like at we prime. At, yeah, we prime here. Yeah. Okay, let's try again. And it works and gives me the resulting graph. And we can check it's the right one. Thank you. So from one, I can go to one. I can go to three. From two, I can go to one and two and three. And from three, I can go to three. And this is the kind of things we like to use to impress people who are using imperative program languages with. Because they, they can't just define reaches in terms of reaches. And maybe they will wonder, like, okay, how does it actually work? And we can try to explain that. Maybe I'll try to explain it to you here, what's happening by, by stepping through the program. Which is not a great thing about Haskell and with other languages, is that it has this rich equational theory. Like, if one thing is equal to another one, we can replace it, and this is not, and this is a way I can understand the program. So here yeah, I've copied the program, and uh, now let's just rewrite the, the thing step by step to see what's happening. So first we'll notice that, okay, we're calling transitive with this particular argument, so let's, let's move it here, so now we have G. We know that the parameter G happens to be this concrete graph in, in this execution. But if G is only used once, so we can move it there. And I'm really just doing algebra here, just like in, in high school when we do um, term transformations in math, which is another great thing about pure uh, functional programming. All right, we, we have this map with key f, and it's applying to this concrete map here. So we know that the result will be a map with the same keys, and all the values will be calls to f. So this might look like this. If, if you're at any point wondering if this was too fast, or are you, you Doubting what I'm saying, you just stop me. It's, it's more fun to have it interactive. In the next step, I'd like to give names to all the things in the map. So let's call them S1, S2, and S3 for the three sets that we're constructing. Uh, then they are bound to calls to F, and we know what F is, so we can copy the definition of F into these. These definitions, and then on the right, we have list comprehension, but the V prime iterates over a concrete list. We don't know what list V prime iterates over, so we can just write out the list. And now the magic happens. The next thing we can do is look at reaches index 3. Like, look at the map to reaches, find the element with key 3. And even though we haven't fully calculated reaches yet, we know enough about it 
to know that if we look into index 3, we will get S3. And the same for the other indices. So we can make this transformation even though we haven't fully evaluated the regions map yet. And this was the magic of not time. Uh, because now we're basically in a very normal program. We have some, some calculations to do, and we can now calculate S3, and once we know that S3 has this value, we can calculate the other ones, and you get the, the sets that we've seen. And I'll stop at this point. That's great. Okay, let's see if we get the right uh, comment now. Uh, you should probably say that um, uh, doing these things is uh, the best way uh, to make prolog loop. Because uh, in prolog you would uh, write very similar things um, and trying to do transitive things since the prolog solver is loop. Okay, I should. Trying to do these things in prolog makes prolog not... Sorry, I couldn't, it was too long to repeat it. <laughs> no, in, in, uh, so defining graphs in prolog is easy. Right. It has relations. That's what prolog does. Yeah, but trying to define the transitive closure right. um, makes, makes the program loop. Okay, so Hesk is better than prolog. I, I, I like that. That's a, that's a short thing to say. Um, yes? You did equational reasoning, but um, there's no no absolute guarantee that you're right because you just choose an evaluation order while you did so. You have to maybe worry a bit about whether you get a loop somewhere or... Uh, yes and no. I, I don't have to worry about whether I get the wrong result. That's just the benefit of, of purity. It's independent of the evaluation order. I do have to worry a little bit about maybe the compiler does something less smart than I in like picking what to do next. Um, okay, who wants to make the obvious um, uh, uh, snarky comment about this thing? It only works for some graphs. <laughs> Why do you say that? <laughs> can, you, can you give me a graph where it doesn't work? Yeah, that has some loop. Huh? Ah, let's, let's try this one. This is what always happens. You say, Hesk is great, you have this example, and somebody comes along, but it doesn't work in this case. So, so here's another graph. I just add one small that. And what happens if I now run this on, on this graph? Okay, well, let's just see it. Well, it starts doing something. It, it knows the result is going to be a graph, and it has node 1, but it kind of stops telling me before it can tell me what's in, in there. And that's disappointing. Because I just made up this like this this nice code directly from declaration, very elegant, very simple, and it, it kind of works great on many examples, but not on all of them. And this is disappointing. And but I don't want to go back to writing imperative kind of graph traversals with like a Go function that keeps track of the scene. Though I mean, I'm not, not going to show you the code that I don't want to see anymore. Many of you will have seen it before. But Really, what, what goes wrong here? Yeah. Well, maybe I'm, I'm about to answer that question, um, but in, in reality, this graph is a function, and you're computing the fixed point of the function, but the way you represent the function is too strict. That, uh, that's a, a good collection of keywords we'll pick up throughout the talk. <laughs> so, so let's see what, what goes wrong just immediately here. So we, we have, we said addition hash, we can do the same kind of stepping through the whole thing, we, even, we can even do the step where we resolve the not time. Like this, using the data structure and reaches in itself was not the problem. We can pass behind that, no longer, reaches no longer plays a role here. But the problem is now that S1 is defined in terms of S2, and S2 is defined in terms of S1, and these operations are too strict. That the set operations need to know the argument before they can make any progress. And, and we need to know S2 before we can get S1, and we need to know S1 before we can get S2. And this is why the compiler is still sitting there uh, trying to find to do something. Um, not the compiler. Uh, sorry, not the, the, the compiler, pro that program, yes, thank you. Um, it's actually sitting there quite, I don't know, sad and disappointed in the corner because it's not actually spending like CPU. Otherwise, the, the top right there would be little, like the graph there would show cycle, like. It's really just blocked. It's just sitting there doing nothing without noticing, which is kind of sad. 
Um, all right, so this didn't work. But I don't want to write the explicit function that traverses a free uh, graph and keeps track of nodes that have been visited and all these things and, and, and more complex examples. A lot of bookkeeping that doesn't make the language declarative anymore. And my hypothesis here is that it could, well, it should work as a user, but then also as somebody who kind of thinks about languages, I also say it could work. And this is what I want to show you. So I've, I've built a library that well, makes it work. That's basically all there's to say. Uh, so this is the same API that we used. This is a normal data set from, from the standard library. Uh, and these are the two operations we use in our example program. And in the library that I'm experimenting with and I built uh, recently is we have a, a very similar module. It's not called data recursive set or recursively definable, which is the thing we're trying to do. And it has a data type, it has two functions. The signatures are very much the same as before. In particular, it's a completely normal pure function. There's no monads, there's nothing else scary. Uh, we also have a way of converting them to normal sets. And, and given that these types, well, let's see what happens. I mean, you can, you can guess what's happening, but I still need to show you. Uh, so let's import this, let's um, use it here. Oh, I have to. Why don't you call the type set? I mean, rs.set is enough? Um, because I, I tend to import type names unqualified. Um, and the module name is fine, but inside the module, the type. Yeah, and I, 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 I think initially I, I made the API so that we could use it unqualified. Uh -huh. um, well, that's wrong. It it's, could, go, could go, probably go one or the other way. Yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, I should talk, say what I'm doing here. Um, so I, I've changed the type here, now I have to fix all the type errors. This compiler is telling me, of course, um, I have to project out to the normal types before I can get to the list, and then it tells me I'm doing things wrong here, but really all I have to do is use the operations from the other module. That's it. Just refactor my code to use a different data structure, which was easy because the API was so similar. So we can reload, we can... Okay, it still works on the first graph, that, that, that's good. Now on the second graph... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that was the wrong one. I, did, I wanted this one. It, also works. Yeah. Ooh. Ooh. Okay. And it not only gives you a result, but it also gives you the correct result, uh, which is, <laughs> we, can, we can check that. Um, all right, that's, that's all I could, we could stop here. Um, we solved the problem, there's a library, you can use it, it does nice, the right things. I could give more examples, but the time is too short for that. Uh, I have a nice example where I'm, um, I'm writing a Compiler, like a program analysis on a language like Haskell with mutual recursion, and you you traverse the data structure, like the syntax tree, and and the kind of data flow equations that you're collecting, like the thing that you you get here after you resolve all the data flow, you, you kind of want to get the recursive things there, um, and it, it's really convenient to if it just works out of the box, very nice. But um, instead of doing that example, let's maybe talk a bit more about but the library itself. Um, so okay, it's a package, you can play around with it. Uh, it, uh, it has more operations than the two I've shown before, it has more operations than these. And my claim is that it can solve any recursive equation or set of equations, like multiple S1, S2, S3 that are kind of recursive, um, using any code you can write with these functions. And it'll give you a result, and it'll give you the right result, give you the, the correct solution. That's, that's nice. Um, for, for that to work, you have to, no, no, no. it's crucial kind of which operations I choose to, to expose in the library. Because not all equations involving sets have solutions. So, uh, Maybe I should do this in THGI here. Yeah. Yeah. So we can write that should be a set. 
Thanks. Um, so, so we, yeah, we can, I can write recursive equations using, this is still too small, is it? Yeah. That's it, that's um, recursive equations using this operation, and I'll give you the result. And when I say it's the right solution, I have to say, it gives me the right solution. I can't say it gives me the solution because there is not a unique solution to this equation. Every other set that happens to have 24 in it, like could be 42, could be 42 and 23, is also a solution to this equation here. But naturally, you know, basically all of these examples, we really want the smallest set. We don't want any elements that just are there because they can. We really only want the elements that have, are there because they have to be. And in that sense, the solution we're caring about is the smallest set that solves our equations. And then something like, um, An equation like this, where we say, okay, we want the set S for which it's true that, this, yeah, I hope you can read it. Um, it feels very, the, the closer I get to the screen, it, it feels smaller. Um, <laughs> let's do it like this. Okay, is this is better. Um, this is not an equation I can write as sets. Um, S should be 42 without all the elements in Z, in S, but that has no solution. You will not find um, any Z that for this is for which this is true. Can you write something with barbas and shade? It feels like that. Say again? With, with barbas and uh, people that, that shade. <laughs> ah, right. Um, so, so, but, yeah, yeah, it's it's the same thing. It's like like the the or the the lying. Um, what was the example? The Greeks and the liars and the yeah. Um, so if I, if I say my library can solve the equation, it's only because I'm excluding some function. So we, you will not find difference in there. Um, and the the theory behind it is we only want monotone functions. Uh, I'll just throw this out for those who who understand. Who, Expect that to be the case for the other ones, not very too much. It just means you can't get you can't use all the functions that you might find in the data set API. Uh, the library is not just sets, it also has uh, recursively defined into the booleans, because it's useful for some examples. Um, and it can even mix. So you can have a set of uh, a set of equations where some equations are about sets and some are bools, and they're connected with functions like member or or others. And you always get a result. So that's the, the user point of view. So maybe you're curious how does it actually work inside. And maybe some of you are very uh, skeptical because you can't really write that library in Haskell. Um, so let's, let's break it down first. Um, and let's first look at how would we solve the problem in an imperative language where we have like mutable references and, and like yeah things like that. And then let's look how we can package this up into the pure API that I just presented. And we'll just while we walk through is we'll focus on three things. The data type, one operation, and then the others are just follow the, the pattern, and then the way of getting the, the actual value out. So for the imperative API the, the way you can solve writing down recursive functions in imperative languages, or typically, is that you break it into multiple steps. You first have to declare all the things that play a role in your recursive function. Then, separately, you can define, fill them with meaning, with meaning, give them definitions, declare the relationships between them, and then the thing can do the solving or whatever, and you get the result. This is incidentally. Quite why in, in a language like C, you, can, you have to declare your functions before you, you use them, and if you have mutually recursive functions, then you have to first give their signatures and then um, call them. At least, maybe that's no longer the case in modern C, I don't know. Um, so this is what we're doing here. We're defining an interface that allows you to declare 
T cells, and then we say, okay, this cell. Oh, sorry. This cell is going to be defined to be the value of that cell plus this exhibition element. And you can do this recursively, just like we've just seen in, in, um, in this example here. Um, and, well, at the end, you want to read the value of. Now, if I were to give you this as a programming example, a uh, programming exercise, I think most of you will just write the obvious thing. Well, um, but I'll still show you the code. So uh, the, the cell remembers the current value as we're trying to learn more and more about these sets. Um, and then all the heavy lifting happens in the insert function. So the, here's basically the, the core idea. We, we read the other cell, we uh, calculate our current, or the, the value we want to have this cell to be. Um, and if it hasn't changed, sorry, if it has changed, then we remember the new value. And then there's a little bit of more bookkeeping that these, um, this is like a list of, of callbacks, a list of things that want to be notified when I'm changing. This is how we propagate information throughout this graph of, of connected cells. And uh, the way we do that here is, we're doing this process here of updating the value, so once when we first learn that, that this cell is going to be related to some other cell, but also we will repeat this update thing every time the other cell changes. And then what we have to do when we, uh, well, and then that's basically all we have to do. Um, don't worry too much about this slide of lots of code. It is really doing what you expect it to do. So uh, you, you have all the cells, you start declaring the relationships, and as you do, uh, every time you learn something new, you will propagate that information throughout the whole set of, of cells, of graphs, and at the end, once there's no more changes, then the whole thing kind of st stops propagating information, and if you then read up the value, you'll get the correct result. So this is maybe the kind of code you would write in Python or Camel. The, the maybe the interesting part for, for this talk is um, how do we get it into into this pure world? Because this is the API we want. We want it to be as close to the declarative data set API. So we want an insert function. It doesn't take the value it defines, it returns it. And we want that the get function. And to do that, um, there's a little preparation I want to do just to, oh, maybe, I'm, yeah, sorry. Um, so the, the sub API that was in L, it was doing side effecting things. And maybe you've learned that you can't escape the I.O. monad. You might be shocked to hear that this is not completely true. You can escape the I.O. monad. There's a function called unsafe perform I.O. And it takes an I.O. action, something that can fire missiles, eject CD drives, upload your files to the internet, and pretends it's a pure value. Pure meaning it's always going to be the same, it doesn't matter when you look at it, it's only been calculated once. All, all these nice things about pure functional programming. Should, they will look like they hold for this thing, even though it's actually side effecting underneath. So it's a bit of a dubious thing. But it is what we have to use if you want to go from uh, this imperative thing to this elegant thing. I'm using imperative and elegant as opposites here, I don't know if that's okay. Um, okay, so let's, let's write this code in, in a simple, naive first uh, approximation. So uh, I wrote a little helper data structure, which is uh, a data structure that takes some I.O. action and doesn't run it. It allows you to run it later. So you, you, this turns the I.O. action into something like just remembers it, stores it away, and then the do now thing will run it. Moreover, it'll run it once. If it has run before, it will not run again. A very small but very convenient general purpose uh, thing here. Uh, this is the code for it. It's not super interesting. Uh, we, we remember the action, we remember the whether we have run it before. One crucial thing, when we are running the action, we first remember that we have already started running the action. This allows us that if, if this action would then by weird chance 
start again calling do now, it will not run a second time. So the order of these two lines is very crucial. But otherwise, this is not too surprising, but this do one thing does. And with this, to help us, this is the code we need to do for the, for the pure graph actor. It's, it's not so much anymore. Um, so we have, we have the insert function, we use this unsafe top on IO thing, which allows us to use the imperative API for propagating values. We create a new cell. Um, we, we also register the relation between this new cell and, and the uh, and our argument. The C2 comes out of R2. Um, but the crucial thing is we don't do it right away. Remember that when we looked at the well, not the back, but the, the recursive set equation, I told you the problem was that the set operations were too strict. They need their arguments before they can do anything. And this is what we have to change. We have to make it lazy. And, and this is why we have this later operator here. This way, the insert function is lazy. It doesn't look at R2 until, uh, well, until later. Um, but instead, it creates a new cell and it can return it. And this is where the magic is. We're deferring, looking at the argument, and doing all the things with it, like registering the relationships between these cells, until late enough. So when we get a value out of this R set, we have to make, of course, make sure that this later thing well, it has to run eventually. If, if, before this runs, the whole thing has kind of has bogus values. So we have to make sure we run this. We also have to make sure that we run these this to do action for all the cells that we depend on. So by look, basically we're building the graph. Nothing happens yet. Once we look at one cell, it'll start triggering all these other. Let's register the relationships between these cells. And when this comes back. We can get the value. So one slide is actually not too scary. Uh, this was simplified a little bit. As I showed you, we, we have other data types. We have to we can mix the data types. We have operations that that connect sets and boards. And then there are some technical problems that don't really change much about the, the high level picture here, but once you have con concurrency, things become hard. And we have concurrency here even if you don't have threats, because unsafe perform IO basically means that it can start evaluating almost any time. Anytime you look at some value that may be a thunk, something that's not evaluated yet, may trigger some IO compilation of unsafe perform IO, and suddenly all, all this code here is, is highly reactant and things become very complicated. Or mildly complicated. Um, and something with basics, but yeah. This was the, the uh, simplified view. And um, yeah, so we can make it work. And maybe to slowly ease into the, the Q&A session, um, I want to pose a question here, maybe and discuss it a little bit. Is this still Haskell? I mean, technically it's Haskell because it was like the .hss file and we compiled it with GHD, but we were using unsafe perform my own. And this is not part of Haskell in like Haskell 1.0, 90s, pure mathematics stuff. Um, so the question is, is it okay to use unsafe perform IO? And I'd, I'd like to put the, this quote from Simon Peyton Jones and co-authors when they presented unsafe perform IO to, Has uh, to use to Haskell, because they made the point that uh, it's unsafe, but that does not mean it's wrong. What it means is that it's no longer the compiler that guarantees that no matter what kind of code I'm writing, it has all the nice properties it has to have. Gives us, but now it's my challenge to to prove it and think it through. So we can we can do that. So what is it that makes Haskell Haskell? Surprisingly, it's not that easily said and done. Uh, there are quite a few things we can expect from Haskell or Haskell programs to be true. Uh, for example, type safety. We we expect that if you run a Haskell program, it will not just crash. It will not just overwrite random memory. If I have something that has type boolean, then it's not a float, all these things. And you can break this property with unsafe perform IO. I mean, it, it looks like it has a type, it has a type, IO A to A, but you can break the type system using it. So now it's my task to think about, think hard whether I've broken the type system or not. I believe I have. And maybe let's leave it at that. Um, 
Independence evaluation order, we, we talked about this briefly when the stepping through. Um, it, it's actually like concurrency. You, things become tricky if we're looking at two things at the same time in this graph. But I think I could solve it, so I think that's all to know. Then very dear to my heart is this kind of equation of reasoning, which you also saw earlier in the talk when we stepped through the program. And there are equivalences between Haskell programs. So this Haskell program is equivalent to that Haskell program. Here we are we're replacing this x with the definition of x. And you should be able to observe the difference between these two programs. Or similar, here what I'm doing is I have a recursive equation, and I'm replacing it with two recursive equations that just call each other. Kind of maybe stupid thing to do, but I can do it. And it's not observable with Haskell. Uh, I'm putting up this example because there's related work that some of you might know about observable sharing. There are like libraries that allow you to observe when values are shared by Haskell and they maybe generate like surf logic circuits based on that. And that's useful. And you could actually implement something like what I presented on top of LAM, but they break already this equality. And I think this is a very a very bold it's not something I would want in my normal daily toolkit of, of programming language. Whereas I, I would claim that my library is, is safe enough to use in like normal circumstances. It does break one thing. It breaks um, lambda lifting. Uh, or it's more, a bit more general, it breaks any kind of transformation that breaks the share. Because in my library, it's very crucial that the yeah, but maybe I can just demonstrate it rather than just talk about it. So here, the S is shared. Um, this S is actually, oh, this, yeah, this S is this one. If I, uh, it looks like we have an audio problem. It's just a bit of Turn it off for now. Oh yeah, it's a, uh, say something about battery. Should I just use the hand mic? Yes. Okay, um, is this on? Yeah. Um, but if I now write something like, I don't know, maybe I want this to be abstract in the number n, and I add another parameter here to make this a function. So this is a transformation that in Haskell you would normally be able to do without varying too much. But now, oh. <laughs> of course, you have to give a complete one. Now we get the same result as before. No, the result of no result. But, this is a transformation that in normal Haskell is semantics preserving, but it is not performance preserving, already in normal Haskell, and even in an asymptotic way. Think about the Fibonacci example that I gave earlier. If I do this thing to the Fibonacci definition, it will still calculate the list of Fibonacci numbers, but it will no longer share the results. And suddenly we go from this very efficient linear code to the, the bad exponential example that we really don't want to, to do. So I would claim that every that a Haskell programmer who's already on the level of playing around with um, um, with like tying the knot tricks, they already have to think about sharing. And the fact that with my library, the difference between breaking sharing can um, can go from it gives you a result, it gives you no gives you no result, may not be too bad. And, and hence my thesis or my hypothesis that. This library does not break Haskell. It still will still feel very much like Haskell. Um, right, and, and that brings me uh, to, to the summary slide. Um, we've seen that laziness is not about not only about avoiding computation. It's really about being able to def solve your problems more declaratively and more elegantly, and especially using recursion. And I would say that every time you have recursion, you have laziness. Even in, in Python or C, they are lazy, but they are only lazy in functions. Because you can define a function using things that you, are, that you will define later. And Haskell goes beyond that by giving you laziness in data structures. And you can define data structures, or you can use data structures before they're fully defined. And with this idea, I'm going one step further. Now we have uh, laziness in data structures like sets or bools that were otherwise strict, and you get the, the right result, and you get a result. Um, it, right, we discussed whether this is pure and still Haskell, and 
maybe it's a bit interesting to notice that it's actually not quite clear what we what we have to discuss here. It's not there's no complete list of things we want to be true about Hester or not. I'll finish the slide and then look at it. Again. Um, and then also how to prove this in like a formal way would be very interesting. And this is like on well, I wouldn't say it's on going work. I hope somebody else will do the work, but I'm I'm very curious about it. And there are some problems that we haven't discussed. Some of them are solved, some of them are unavoidable. And you can read about them in a series of blog posts that I wrote. Uh, and it's linked from the from the page on the program. And with that, I think I have time for a few questions, hopefully. Yeah, so perhaps jumping right into this question of um, if the, is this still Haskell? I mean, one way, if you have a language and you're not sure if the language itself is consistent, one way to make, you know, to convince yourself that it's consistent is to give a model, so to give a semantics for that. Mm. Um, so in this case, my question would be, well, we have the semantics of Haskell, and actually Haskell is, uh, so lazy evaluation is the evaluation strategy, but there's actually, the Haskell report actually, I think, only mentions it in one or two places. So the Haskell report, the language definition, is very much about the semantics where you have this bottom, which you alluded to in the title. Um, so in this case, I would ask, well, if you could give such an equation, what would be the semantics? Oh, do we have that again? Yes. Okay, cool. Maybe eventually. Yes. Um, this is a good question. I've, I feel like it should be possible to give a denotational semantics for this whole thing that is not too dissimilar from, from the one you would see about Haskell. But I've, so far I've failed. And the problem is that like, usually denotational semantics, like that give you a nice mathematical model of the language, um, lambda lifting will be inherently an equation, and so it can't be here. So we have to have, we have to find some denotation of semantics that tells you whether there's a difference between between uh, these two lines. Oh, so, okay, yeah, it has, it has finished. <laughs> um, <laughs> a difference between the first and the, and the last example there. And it should be possible, I haven't figured out yet how. But yeah, I would agree that this, this would be a very good way of answering this whole discussion and question. Start with this one, and I think we have one or two questions, depending on the answer. So maybe let's uh, uh, talk about the things that already work. Um, so you showed us a couple of types. Um, what is the class of types um, that you could make recursive? Um, what do they have to satisfy? Right. So in mathematical terms, they have to be. The, well, there are two answers. One is anything you can give to an imperative solver like. Like, like, like the one we saw here. Um, as long as what comes out of it is an equation and a, a uniquely defined solution, so it could be an ILP solver or something. More concretely, about things we can solve this way, with this particular mutation or something similar like it, the fixed point iteration, that would be a, a partial order um, where all the functions are monotone. And and then it gets a bit hairy whether we want the the hard requirement that all chain like all sequence of things that go up in this thing are finite, then it's the easiest, and that's the one we have so far. Um, if we relax that, we kind of, there are some corner cases where I'm actually not quite sure what we'll end up with. It might be that then suddenly, depending on how you do the, the, the iteration, you might be terminating one case more than the other case, and then we may, must make sure that this is not something you can trigger by, for example, looking at one cell first rather than looking at the other. So, so I think, um, we can relax a little bit more than just uh, finite height, but then engineering becomes a bit more hairy and, and worth exploring. Okay, uh, taking a last question. Two short questions. First one is, <laughs> um, when you say that uh, you have got this, this the, um, the problem with um, um, lambda lifting not, not working, not, not lambda lifting, um, yeah, lambda yeah. lifting mm -hmm. not working. Is it because, are you saying that it cannot be done or is there something work in progress? I, th I think it cannot be done. And so the se second question is, do you not intend to write it up and um, submit a paper on it? Uh, I've share submitted thoughts? it as a call to ICFP. Mm -hmm. 
And if you if somebody wants to see the preprint, I'm happy to share it and get some feedback on it. So just um, yeah. So thank you very much, Joachim. Thank you. Talk.